All right. Well, it is the top of the hour right now. Um, so we will get rolling. Um, thank you, everybody. For and Ken is going to do the welcome. I will start turning off um, cameras and microphones, but you do have the ability to turn those back on when it is time for questions. So when um, Eric opens it up for questions, feel, please feel free to do that. Um, with that, um, Ken is going to do our welcome and thank you guys for joining us. Well, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and uh, welcome to another of the webinars in the Create Energy Center series. Um, my name is Ken Walls. I'm the director for the Create Energy Center, and it's my pleasure to uh, uh, introduce to you today Eric Nispel, um, who will be our speaker speaking on the heat of biofuel combustion. Um, I can, uh, can tell you that this is another in several of the uh, series that we have had uh, of webinars where uh, folks submitted entries for our Teaching Tips, Tricks, and Strategies competition. Um, so we are uh, very glad to uh, hear from Eric um, uh, on this topic today. Um, before, I, before I introduce Eric, let me uh, just say a few other things about CREATE as well as some of our upcoming programming to make folks aware of. Um, so uh, I think uh, most folks are probably aware of the CREATE website. It's just createenergy.org. You see a screenshot of the homepage here today. And you can find information about all of our upcoming events on that webpage, uh, as well as future webinars, workshops, and activities that we have planned uh, stretching over the spring and summer of this year. Uh, our next webinar will be coming up on Friday, May 6th. Uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Deb Hall, and she, uh, the title of her talk will be Meet the Building Automation Systems Tech Barbie and See Her Smart Brand Hotel in Action. Uh, some of you may know uh, Deb Hall from Valencia Community College down in Florida. Um, she's been working on a National Science Foundation project there to uh, broaden participation in the uh, building energy sciences field. Um, if you're interested in participating in that webinar, uh, please contact our, uh, our project director, Gabby Temple, um, and you can see her, uh, her information at the bottom of the screen here, just Gabrielle Temple at canyons.edu. Um, uh, before I introduce our speaker, let me just mention that uh, we encourage you to uh, add questions into the chat window as we go. Um, and uh, myself and a few others will be uh, monitoring those uh, questions and then we'll uh, field them for our speaker at the end of the presentation and we should hopefully have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, a little bit about our speaker, Eric. Uh, I met Eric, uh, boy, several years ago now at one of our, uh, our biofuels workshops that we ran. Uh, Eric began his 29-year science teaching career as a Peace Corps volunteer in Zimbabwe, uh, where limited lab resources fostered his interest in low-cost, locally available, and effective lab equipment. And I think that's probably something most of us can appreciate. Uh, here is uh, your vocabulary challenge for today. Uh, his peripatetic <laughs> lifestyle <laughs> had him teaching on the Navajo Reservation, Tanzania, and finally, St. Louis, where for the last 20 years, he has taught chemistry using bottle caps, balloons, and Lego blocks. And I know several of you are now accessing your uh, online dictionaries to look up <laughs> So uh, Eric has been uh, processing biodiesel fuel from the cafeteria for his school for more than 10 years. And he's going to share with us a little bit today about his experience working with uh, biodiesel fuel. So with that said, take it away, Eric. All right. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Gabby, and everyone at Create Energy uh, for this opportunity to share a little bit of what goes on in my lab. I am going to try to reconnect and share my screen, please. Was that effective? Okay. Uh, so, uh, as mentioned, I met Ken uh, probably a dozen years ago in Madison at uh, one of the summer biofuel workshops uh, that helped propel my uh, bio making uh, biodiesel process uh, from a lab bench activity that we did in school to a, a full blown uh, operating uh, system in the basement of our science building. Um, we process about two to three hundred gallons of uh, waste vegetable waste vegetable oil each year and try to uh, cut down on the amount of waste oil that ends up uh, being transported off campus. So today what I wanna do is follow up with that benchtop uh, biodiesel process as uh, what to do with it, uh, what's the next extension 
uh, once your students make biodiesel. And so uh, some of my goals today, of course, are to spread the gospel about uh, biodiesel and its use in the uh, high school chemistry lab and beyond. Um, now hopefully I will try to ex explain the technique that I use for measuring the heat content or the calorimetry of different fuels, uh, focusing specifically on the WIC system uh, I've developed and um, then share a little bit about the procedure for the lab activity uh, and uh, any other ideas that people might have questions about in terms of biodiesel in the laboratory. I do have a few other extensions if, if those come up. So uh, many of us are probably uh, already making biodiesel in small batches at the, at the bench top in the uh, high school or uh, college level. Uh, here you can see uh, pictures of some of my students doing a, a make and shake where they make about 100 uh, milliliters of biodiesel and then we do the separation, et cetera, on the bench top. And of course, um, some of you may test it for soap. You might uh, teach students about the water content or the cloud point. Uh, but one aspect that perhaps people don't do as much is to uh, actually measure the energy content and try to burn the fuel to see how much energy or caloric value uh, is in there. And so today what I'd like to demonstrate or show a little bit is how to uh, burn it safely and I also burn uh, ethanol as another biofuel example. This is the common lab, uh, high school lab experiment. You'll see a soda can calorimeter filled with cold water. The equation for heat content is the mass times the specific heat times the delta T. And that is uh, the heat transferred into the cold water. And so some high, uh, a lot of teachers probably are familiar with burning a potato chip, a peanut, or some sort of uh, food item underneath the soda can to generate the heat and then count the calories lost by the uh, burning fuel, uh, which is equal to the heat gained by the cold water. And so I've adapted that strategy of using a uh, soda can with cold water and instead of burning a peanut or a potato chip, um, I've adapted it to burning uh, samples of biofuel. And so what you're looking at here are a couple of screen grabs from my actual uh, lab handout. Uh, you can see the instructions on the left, uh, explain to the students some of the technical ideas of how to set up the equipment. The data table down below suggests that you need to keep track of certain aspects such as the mass of cold water, the starting temperature and final temperature of the cold water, and then uh, near the bottom, the mass of the fuel in the beginning and the mass of the fuel at the end. And then by subtraction, they can calculate how much fuel was actually consumed during the experiment. And that's kind of the wrinkle uh, that um, sets this lab apart. Uh, once you have the quantity of fuel burned, you can then extend it and do the calculations such uh, to the point here in question two, you can see um, calculate the energy content in kilojoules per gram or kilojoules per mole. And you can do that for the biodiesel as well as the ethanol. So uh, a, a common high school lab topic, uh, just putting a little spin on it using biofuels. So uh, this is a part where I pre-recorded a video and I'd like to do a little bit of what I used to do and why it didn't work so well. And then uh, forward to how um, I've modified it to make it work much better uh, with the new strategy. Cheap, inexpensive. So in this uh, video here, you can see that I start with a uh, aluminum weighing pan and a bent paper clip. And it used to be that I would start with a cotton ball. And I'm gonna play the video here. And we'll see if this is gonna work smoothly. Drops. I'm gonna turn the volume off and just narrate over it. So you can see that what used to happen was you'd get a cotton ball, soak it with your fuel. And in this case, I'm testing biodiesel. And you would put about 20 to 25 drops on there and uh, sort of get it soaked. 
and then you would end up igniting it. Well, a couple of problems with this setup, and uh, the problem is it burns well enough. Now, let me get here. Okay, there it is. Use the aim and flame. The cotton ball lights up very nicely, but um, the way that the cotton ball is soaked with fuel uh, eventually turns into a very large uh, and sort of out of control flame. And you're looking there, you can see a lot of soot. Uh, the flame is reaching four to five inches tall and it becomes a little bit difficult to gather all of that heat under your soda can. Even with a heat shield, there, the flame is so tall and so uh, out of control that you use a lot of heat as it goes up around the edges of the soda can. And so I did that for several years and I got very, very minimally bad results about the energy content of biodiesel. I was getting uh, easily 50% error in terms of what we should have been getting only because there was so much heat being lost. And you can see I've tried to funnel the heat using a bean can, et cetera. But here we'll go and I wanna get into what I've done recently to make this an improved and better and neater, uh, more effective lab. Here, I'm gonna let the video play and I'm gonna let the narration uh, go. Here we go. The new technique I use for burning fuels uh, is to resort to using sand as a wick. Is that audible to everybody? Ken, can you hear that okay? I can hear it. It's a little quiet, but I can make it out. Okay. Uh, I'm going to let it go then uh, instead of trying to narrate over it. Yeah, I can just turn up my speakers and I'm sure others can too. I have two different types of sand that I'm using actually. Uh, the ethanol burns really well with a coarser sand um, and it is reusable from year to year. It dries out really well. And the coarse sand allows for a good mixture with oxygen. And I color coordinate so that between classes, I know that all the sand that's in a light colored bottle cap, uh, orange or yellow, is going to be used for uh, ethanol. When it comes to burning biodiesel, I use a much finer grain of sand, uh, and it does a better job of stacking and piling into a little anthill. The reason for the anthill is to create a little bit of a uh, better mixture with oxygen and you uh, know makes it easier for the biodiesel to ignite in the beginning and of course I use darker color bottle caps the blue or the greens uh, and that helps me keep track of biodiesel so they don't get mixed up between classes. As per the lab instructions students are uh, instructed to put about 25 drops of ethanol onto the coarse sand and that's going to create uh, a little bit of a uh, change in mass. Students then weigh the bottle cap moistened with a fuel before, and then they weigh it again afterwards, and they will notice that uh, there's obviously going to be a change in the mass caused by the loss of fuel. Quick ignition. The ethanol burns very nicely. Controllable and gives you a nice clean flame and burns with a nice inch to two inch flame. Very easily controlled and of course reusable. And when it's out of fuel, it extinguishes itself. Students can wait. And that's the ethanol. You can see that it burns really nicely. It's easy to ignite. Uh, there is a little bit uh, of a difference when we go to try to ignite uh, the biodiesel. And so I'll show that part here. Do the experiment, students usually burn the ethanol first. It's very easy, uh, hard to mess up. The biodiesel becomes a little more fidgety, a little harder to ignite. And so I asked them to do that second. But we start with a bottle cap full of uh, fine sand, they can add 20 drops of biodiesel. You want to get the sand soaked, but you don't want it uh, standing in excess fuel. So 15, 20 drops. And of course, when they're doing that, it's very helpful to push the sand into a bit of an anthill. 
the reason for that is when it comes time to ignite, having that piled up makes it a little easier to get a good ignition. So I use these little butane uh, micro torches, heat the sand a little bit, the biodiesel ignites, and now you have a nice, easy to move, controllable uh, way to burn the diesel. You can slide it under the soda can. You can uh, safely control it. It's clean, cleaner, less soot. And as it heats up and generates its own heat, um, that little anthill of, of fuel and sand uh, grows in size, and it usually gets about an inch to an inch and a half tall. Very clean, very safe, very easy to use. And again, when it's uh, out of biofuel, um, it'll run itself out, and the students can then take a second measurement of the mass of the fuel bottle cap and get a data point for how much fuel has actually been used during their trial. So you can see it's pretty cheap, easy, and uh, the materials are, are pretty uh, easy to get a hold of. I mean, the hardest part about this lab technique is actually collecting the bottle caps, which means you probably have to drink a few beverages in order to get the right color of bottle caps if you want to color coordinate and sort out your caps. So, you know, you can always get started with that this weekend. Uh, here is uh, the video I made last year uh, when we were hybrid learning during the pandemic and students at home uh, were able to watch the, the, the video of the lab rather than being in school to perform it. Half the students in school performed it, half would watch it at home. But what I uh, want to do is fast forward here and you can see sort of the setup. There's the ring stand, uh, the metal ring, I use a glass stirring rod to hold the soda can over the ring. Uh, a folded up piece of aluminum makes a great heat shield. And over to the left, you'll see two different bottle caps full of sand, uh, the lighter one for the ethanol and the uh, darker bottle cap for uh, the biodiesel. The micro torches are really helpful and easy uh, instead of using matches. Uh, to get the biodiesel to ignite, the flame point or the flash point is a little bit uh, more difficult to reach. So the micro torch is a big help in sort of uh, heating up the sand, heating up the fuel and getting it to ignite uh, more rapidly. All right, and then of course, some sort of thermometer to record the starting and final temperature of your water. And then here we can sort of show you what it looks like all together. Let's see here, where did it go? Hit play down as close as we can to the heat and let the fuel burn. Let it burn as long as you can. Burns out, record the maximum final temperature. And so that was burning ethanol. And if we fast forward through here, you can see here's a little bit of biodiesel in action. About the same height, protect the heat upwards, direct it upwards with the uh, heat shield, and let it burn. You can notice that the flame is bright, uh, but there's not a lot of soot. There will be soot. And of course, if students lower the can too low and sort of start to smother the flame, they'll get more soot buildup on the bottom of their can. But if there's a, a, you know, a little bit of a space there, the flame burns really well, provides plenty of heat, uh, and they get much better results this way uh, with a slow, steady burn instead of a cotton ball that just goes up uh, in a matter of a few moments. All right, now this is one typical lab activity that's for chemists, we love to characterize our uh, material that we produce. So you manufacture the biodiesel, you synthesize it from the waste oil, and you wanna know how, 
you know, how good is it or how much energy content is it? And you can compare it against, uh, uh, you know, textbook resources in terms of what you're supposed to get and what the students are able to get. And they can analyze their data for a percent error uh, and have a lot of fun with it. Uh, there are other things to do with biodiesel uh, in the high school or uh, college lab. And the next uh, slide uh, sort of shows that. Several years ago, when I was doing biodiesel, uh, well, several years ago at the same school, I, I've been doing biodiesel, uh, I did a project with students that involved putt-putt boats. And the putt-putt boats, of course, are a very old school, old fashioned form of a steamboat that relies on uh, heating up water in the little uh, putt-putt motor uh, and then it turns energy into a form of transportation. Uh, many years ago when I was doing it, I used it as a way of teaching gas laws because we were teaching, uh, I was using the steam engine as a form of explaining gas laws and the temperature pressure uh, relationships. But you can also use these putt putt boats in terms of measuring and looking at uh, mileage if you wanted to, in terms of how many, uh, rotations you could make in the circular pan, um, how far you can make your putt-putt go on a certain number of drops. And there's all different kinds of ways uh, to sort of measure uh, the value of your biodiesel. So I'm gonna play part of this video and give you a chance to enjoy uh, why they're called putt-putt boats. And hopefully if your speakers are turned up a little bit louder, uh, maybe we can hear this, here we go. There you go. It, it, once it gets hot, it boils, yeah. And so when that putt-putt boat was making its turn around the corner here, you look inside there, you can see that there is an open flame. And that open flame is what's heating uh, the water in the engine turning it into steam. The steam creates a pressure bubble and it uh, forces the boat to move forward. And this, uh, when you buy these putt-putt boats, they typically come with a little metal spoon and a wax candle uh, that you can slide under there as a heat source. But at this workshop, we are using that same little metal spoon with a bunch of sand and putting a biofuel on there and generating a uh, the uh, speed of the boat or the number of rotations of the boat uh, using a certain amount of uh, biofuel, either the diesel or uh, the ethanol. So that is another alternative way of sort of making use of your uh, little mini batches of biodiesel that you might be making uh, in the laboratory. And so uh, with that, um, I will, whoop, go over here uh, and I'll thank uh, Ken and Gabby for all the help. I'll thank everybody who attended uh, for your attention. Uh, and if anybody has questions or comments, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear uh, what sort of questions you might have for me at this time. Eric, I can see one in the uh, chat box, which was one I had as well. Where did you get the putt-putt boats? I've never heard or seen of those before. <laughs> so they are a 100-year-old uh, toy that have been around for, uh, you know, uh, generations. Uh, you can still purchase them. Um, I originally started getting them from a high school science supply catalog called Kelvin, and kelvin.com uh, does sort of all kinds of uh, interesting little kits uh, for high school science and engineering and industrial tech. They'll have little, uh, well, now they'll have uh, kits for building different types of home models, uh, solar panel kits, wind generating kits, and uh, they've been doing that. And they're, you know, the mousetrap cars uh, that you might have for an engineering club or for science Olympiad. Uh, Kelvin.com uh, will certainly have them. And uh, I don't know if you noticed in that uh, slide, up above, the students have their homemade boats made out of styrofoam or plywood. And then we bought the uh, putt-putt motors separately and were able to design them into their uh, boat construction. And we made it a, 
a real big cross curricular where they would go to the industrial tech lab and use the jigsaw and the drill press to make their boats and then come back to the chem lab, paint them up and make them run and learn about the gas laws. That looks like a great interdisciplinary project. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we never did that in any of my industrial arts classes. We built CO2 race cars and mousetrap cars and stuff like that, but never, never putt putt boats. I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, and they make a great noise when you get them to run. You, you can make your own engine out of uh, copper tubing uh, and you can coil the copper tubing and get the same idea, but it'll be a, a silent engine. You won't get the uh, popping diaphragm uh, that some of these uh, little motors have on them. Uh, just a couple other questions in the chat that came through, Eric, and I'd encourage anybody else, feel free to uh, add them if you have. Uh, how did you come up with the idea to use the sand? <laughs> well, it was uh, from workshops that I've been to um, and people on Twitter. I, I go to a lot of chem ed, uh, chemistry workshops. Uh, if, if your people are not familiar with uh, chem ed, it's a Canadian organization uh, and they host uh, teacher in services, uh, summer workshops every other year. Uh, and so chem ed um, every other year, uh, 2023 is going to be back up in uh, Canada, but uh, they often are in the United States. And one of those workshops, uh, people were presenting uh, this idea of sand. Uh, and um, the, the, the putt putt boat was one that I'd used many years ago, and they were doing it at this workshop. Uh, and I was like, oh, yeah, great. I, yeah, somebody else is doing putt putt boats. And they had put the sand in the spoon. Uh, to make the putt-putt go. And I was like, ah, oh, light bulb idea. I can make that work in the lab without the spoon. I'll switch it to bottle caps. They're not going to burn. Nothing's going to smoke, break, or uh, uh, and if it gets spilled, it's no big deal. And so it was just sort of seeing and hearing other people's idea, modifying them to fit my own needs. Yeah, that's great. Having tried to do uh, uh, fuel combustion experiments before myself, I can appreciate uh, having one that doesn't get all smoky. And, <laughs> <laughs> we used to have to burn stuff in the fume hood because you just, you know, doing that all day on the bench top with a smoky cotton ball combustion right. was dreadful, you know. The cotton ball idea came from a much previous chem ed workshop where a grad student was demonstrating the idea of uh, biofuel and heat measuring and they were using a paper clip and a cotton ball and I stole that idea but it just never uh, agreed with me because the original version that I used was trying to put biodiesel into a little wick like a alcohol burner yeah we tried it that way too <laughs> no luck no yeah. luck I tried laying the wick in a or kind of in a in a spoon and seeing if the biodiesel would wick up fast enough to keep it going and it just wouldn't sustain a flame for any period of time. So I go to the workshop and the presenter was talking about the cotton ball and I was like, okay, well that's got to work much better than than a little alcohol burner or spirit burner that you know I'm trying to adapt. And it was it was a big improvement. We were able to get a flame, but again, too much soot, uh, too much heat loss totally out of control. Um, and the kids end up with soot all over their fingers, all over the soda can and becomes a really big mess to clean up at the end. And so controlling the burn, using the sand, just has been a game changer in terms of how effective and how much fun we can have with the lab in, in school. And there was another question we had in the chat. Uh, do the students need to wear gloves for this experiment? Uh, I don't. Uh, you can. Um, I don't see any reason to wear gloves. The biodiesel uh, isn't going to cause them a problem. The ethanol that we use doesn't cause a problem. Um, you know, sometimes when you're handling hot objects, uh, having an extra layer of rubber may give you a false sense of uh, just how warm something may be. Uh, and they may actually pick it up and then realize it might melt their glove. And so I'm, I'm not I'm not one who's going to recommend gloves uh, for this lab. I did in the video uh, only for aesthetic reasons. <laughs> well, and if there's if there's little soot, you don't have the problem that that yeah 
you would otherwise with creating a tremendous mess and you know kids with black hands and stuff like that so and if they get a little soot on their fingers there's the uh biodiesel soap that we make from the uh, leftover glycerin that comes out of our uh process uh we make a little bit of our own glycerin based uh biodiesel soap and nothing works better in the lab uh to get anything off your hands than uh the biodiesel soap I can remember you bringing some of that soap with you to the workshop in Madison when you visited us back several years ago. <laughs> it works. It really does. Uh, we had a, a question here from uh, Christian Jensen, another past workshop participant. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, he's wondering about the, the worksheet associated with the lab and if you could uh, go back over the Q equals MC delta T equation and, and um, how, that, how that was uh, applied in the lab. Sure thing. Um, I'll go to this slide. It show, sort of shows the, the, the chemistry process. So, um, Ken, does my cursor show up on the screen? Yes. Yep. Good. Okay. So, uh, the way I instruct students about uh, calorimetry is basically heat exchange. Down below, you have uh, an exothermic process where the fuel is burning and releasing the heat energy. Well, the concept is whatever heat is released underneath is going to equal the heat absorbed up above by the cold water. So heat lost is going to equal heat gained. Whatever heat you gain in the cold water, you can associate with uh, the burning of your fuel source. So how do you calculate the heat change or the heat content of your hot water? How much energy was added? Uh, the equation is the mass of the water, the specific heat of the water, multiplied by the temperature change of the water. So if you burn the fuel for much longer and you get a larger delta T, you're going to obviously have a larger uh, H value in terms of the energy absorbed. So uh, typically, the ethanol uh, burns for a, a shorter period of time. Uh, we get less heat. However, at the end, you'll see in the calculations that we try to compare it, uh, even though they may burn for different amounts of time, at the end, we take the energy and divide it by the mass of the fuel. So we get calories or joules per gram of fuel. And then students can really see just how dense biodiesel is in terms of its energy content compared to the uh, ethanol. I hope uh, that explains a little bit. Is there more that they want to see? Well, I had sort of a follow-up question to that. You uh, you mentioned uh, in your early experiments, you had really, really large uh, percent errors when you were trying to compare to accepted values of the energy content of fuel. Once you made the uh, switch to the sand wick, how did, how did the results look? Uh, better. <laughs> <laughs> Well, instead of having uh, 45 or 50 percent error, we're 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 uh, we're closing in on 25 and and 30 percent error. There's still a considerable heat loss. It's not a perfect system, uh, but uh, students readily see the weakness in the experiment. And so, if we can, everything we can do to trap that heat and funnel it into the cold water, the better the result. And so, by Using a smaller, more controlled and prolonged flame, we get a much uh, better transfer of heat. Uh, and so the results, they, they get better. And again, if, if you have students who aren't going to be conscientious about the heat shield, uh, if students aren't going to be conscientious about how high they have the soda can uh, and they're constantly sort of leaving it too high, uh, they're not going to get the same good results. If you bring that soda can down close, and then adjust the soda can as the flame changes, uh, you're going to maximize your results. Yeah, I, I think if you're getting 20, 30 percent air, that's that's better than I ever got with marshmallows or yeah. you know, peanuts or anything like that. You know, so for this kind of a system without having a, a truly closed calorimeter, 20, 30 percent air is really good. <laughs> yeah, they can get it if they work at it. Yeah. Uh, we had a question from uh, Andrew McMahon uh, down at uh, Central Carolina, who I know has made some biofuel of his own over the years. Uh, and he asks, have you ever used uh, untransesterified oil, uh, just, just raw waste oil, to compare the energy difference between the oil feedstock and the fatty acid methyl ester biodiesel? You know, it's crossed my mind, but I haven't done the experiment uh, 
I would guess that it's going to be a little, I know the oil will burn. I can imagine it's going to be a little trickier to ignite it. Uh, of course, the biodiesel has a much better viscosity, uh, should have a better uh, ignition point. Uh, but I personally haven't done it, but I could easily see somebody doing that as an extension, you know, a third column, if you will, of vegetable oil, biodiesel, and ethanol, if you wanted to, and, and see how the results change and see how the soot change, see, see how uh, easy or hard it is to ignite the vegetable oil uh, and explain to students that's kind of why we do the chemistry on the vegetable oil in the first place. Yeah, I'd be, uh, I'd be curious to see if it, if it, if it ignited and burned. I know uh, when we were making biodiesel fuel at, at Madison College, we would have the students compare the viscosity of the, the feedstock versus the biodiesel product um, because you can measure that pretty readily and uh, it, it's a night and day difference. Between yeah, them. right. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to guess you probably don't get uh, the same uh, luck, uh, so to speak, with, with the flame size. Um, it may smell nicer. You might get a little odor of your French fry or popcorn shrimp coming through better. Uh, the biodiesel, you know, kind of doesn't have any smell at that point. So um, it might be interesting for the students to, to compare and see that. That would be a good idea. Erica, uh, another question that's coming across the bow here. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you make, uh, I think you said 200 some gallons of fuel each year at your school. Um, I, I imagine that's a lot more than you can use in the putt-putt boat. What, what, <laughs> what do you do with the rest of it? <laughs> well, uh, funny you should ask. Can I uh, change my uh, screen share here for a second? Let me see if I can make this uh, contraption work here. Let's switch over here to the iPad for just a second. And uh, da, 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 da. did it work? We're still looking at your oh, okay. slides. Oh, now it's switching. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so this is the uh, couple of pictures from our processing room downstairs in our uh, science building. Um, and you can see a couple of barrels of waste oil on the left um, come from the kitchen. I have a bubbler in there. Uh, we dry out the oil uh, for as long as I can in between batches. Uh, in the middle is sort of a spinoff of the old apple seed uh, processor uh, that used to be done with a uh, electric uh, water heater. Uh, I redesigned it to use a 55 gallon barrel with a, an electrical um, uh, heat element on the outside. So it's got a nice uh, sort of uh, a heat belt around the uh, bottom of the barrel here. Uh, and then, of course, the pump and the plumbing, and then, of course, the, the, the wash tank. And so, yeah, I do about uh, 90 liters a batch, which is about 22 to 25 gallons a batch. And uh, if I can make about eight batches during or 10 batches during the school year, uh, I, I consider it pretty good. But, yeah, our uh, plant operations crew have several uh, tractors and uh, John Deere gators uh, that are diesel powered. Um, I myself, uh, well, here we are uh, loading up one of the tractors uh, with one of our very first early batches of biodiesel. And uh, I myself, um, you know, drive a diesel car. It just so happens. So, you know, when inventory is high, uh, you know, we, I, I help out. I do my part and I lower my carbon footprint coming and going to work. So uh, win, win, win for everybody. Oh, that's great. That's great. And that's all waste oil coming from your cafeteria, correct? <laughs> correct. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the goal was to try to uh, match how much they uh, discharge and try to capture all of it. But I'll tell you, during the pandemic, uh, fried food became the go-to uh, meal in terms of, you know, packing it up and, and moving it around to different venues. Uh, it, it changed our whole uh, menu, uh, a lot more French fries than we ever ate. Uh, so there's no way I could keep up. Uh, this year, we're back to normal, and, and I'm, I'm not quite there keeping up. But yeah, I, I could make way more than uh, 200 gallons a year if I had more time, more manpower. Uh, they really do pump out uh, plenty of grease to keep me in business. 
Does the excess grease go to uh, some sort of recycler in town? Do you know what happens to it? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a rendering truck. Like most restaurants, they'll come and uh, get it. But then, you know, that's an expense the school has to pay for. So uh, if I can keep up my end, we, we can reduce the expenses and the, and the carbon footprint all around. I'll make uh, one more uh, one more invitation there. If anybody has any remaining questions, feel free to stick them in the chat window or uh, uh, Gabby can enable your microphone if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask in person. Um, Eric, this is great. It's, uh, it's been a while since I've talked to uh, any teachers that have taken their biodiesel work quite as far as you have. So this <laughs> is a, a really interesting entry into our, our teaching tips and tricks and strategies competition. I was glad to see the entry and uh, so thankful for you sharing your work with us. I know there are a lot of other high school teachers out there making biodiesel in their classroom. And the classroom question always becomes, once you've made the fuel, what do you do with it, right? right. How do you characterize it and do something meaningful with it for your students? And I think the, uh, the, the combination of measuring the heat of combustion here, along with the practical applications of the putt-putt boats that you have is, uh, it's really great for students to be able to see that they can synthesize a product and then right away, you know, test and see if it's any good and then put it to yeah. use. Yeah. And, you know, if you want to make biodiesel earlier in the year as part of a one chapter on chemical reactions and synthesis, store the biodiesel, put it in a glass jar, you know, a few months later when you get to gas laws or calorimetry or energy, uh, you know, bring their samples back out. They'll be excited to see something that they made earlier uh, come back and uh, be practical and used in a different part of the, of the same year. Uh, they do find a little bit of meaning in that and appreciate uh, sort of the connections being made between topics. Yeah, so that actually is a question I have for you, Eric. I, I, I know you're a chemistry instructor. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the class that this is part of? Is this a, a general chemistry class that all students take? Is it advanced placement chemistry, organic chemistry? What are we talking about? Here? <laughs> well, uh, great question. Uh, I currently teach a, a 10th grade uh, sort of accelerated or honors level uh, chemistry. Uh, and so that's where, you know, we do the general first year topics. And uh, the common first year topics are, you know, uh, energy transfer and calorimetry. So it fits really well. Um, the putt-putt boats uh, were more useful when I was doing a, a sort of a lower level or regular level chemistry. And we were able to do a lot more project-based activities that could take a longer extended period of time. And so there was no problem with sort of making biodiesel early in the year and then later in the spring when we got to gas laws, bring it back and do the cross-curricular unit with putt-putt boats and go over to IT, the industrial tech room for a day and make their boats and paint them up. And then come back and spend sort of a week on that putt-putt boat unit between making them, uh, building them, testing them and getting them to run and then doing, you know, sort of follow-up lab reports with it. Um, uh, that was also 10th grade. Uh, but uh, in the past, I've taught a... Uh, 12th grade carbon chemistry or organic chemistry senior elective. Uh, and in that class, uh, I bring biodiesel back again. And we talk about more in depth of uh, the actual organic reaction mechanism of the synthesis reaction. Uh, and students, again, make biodiesel. Uh, and then we titrate it. And, uh, you know, I'll look at the rancid uh, acid content of the waste oil first. We run our reaction. We synthesize it. Uh, and then uh, in that same class, we make the soap. So uh, the triglycerides get turned into biodiesel, the triglycerides get turned into soap, and they start to see similarities and distinctions between those two organic reactions. So um, it fits so nicely at all levels. Uh, I, you know, uh, boy, I could keep going on and on, but outside of the classroom, uh, we have an engineering club and I should probably share my screen back to this. Folks, if you're in high school, uh, hang with me for just a second and let me uh, get this back to the uh, PowerPoint, please. Um, let's see, participate, no, uh, share. Uh, let's see here, advanced, da, 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 da. Can you see the uh, PowerPoint now? Yep. Okay, uh, I got too many 
little windows open here. Shoot. You can also see the chat box, right? Well, I see my chat box. I don't see yours. <laughs> I got layers and layers of things popping up here. Okay, let me get that out of the way. All, all I see is your slides right now, Eric. Okay, perfect. All right, so uh, outside of the classroom, all right, so you do biodiesel in the chemistry lab or you do biodiesel in the high school, AP, whatever. So here's the other aspect that we do outside of the classroom. We have an engineering club, uh, and in Missouri, there is a statewide uh, competition, and it's called the Super High Mileage Vehicle Competition. And so high schools all over the state are building and uh, designing and, and trying to manufacture um, small little super efficient vehicles uh, as an engineering experiment. And they typically fit that uh, three wheel design. Uh, they need to hold one driver. And the, and the goal is to uh, build the most economical vehicle possible. And at our competition, there's a biodiesel category and then there's the gasoline ethanol blended category. And of course our school competes in the uh, biodiesel category. And uh, so the students outside of my class who never come into my chemistry room, some of them are picking up information about biodiesel just by being in this club and learning the uh, idea of design and engineering with uh, the diesel powered engines. So yeah, that's another source that we supply biodiesel for. Although at 125 miles to the gallon, we sure don't burn very much. <laughs> Just imagine if all of our cars could do that well. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's another extension to how biodiesel, you know, fits in so many different avenues uh, in a high school uh, curriculum. Eric, I'm curious, uh, you, you know, for those that have made biodiesel, you know, one of the reagents that's necessary is uh, methyl alcohol or methanol. Um, and I'm just curious if you've had any issues safety concerns around storage, handling, and use of methyl alcohol and, and how you address those? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the short answer is no, I don't have any problems. Uh, we are extremely safety focused and the new room uh, that they built uh, when we they redid our science building is specifically designed uh, for methanol vapors. Uh, the biodiesel room has... Uh, <laughs> It was designed by engineers who uh, knew a thing or two about spark proofing uh, a room. And so uh, there are, you know, spark proof outlets, spark proof switches everywhere. Uh, and uh, the ventilation is uh, absolutely, uh, uh, I guess, what do you call it? Negative pressure. Uh, it's so well ventilated. The, the HVAC is circulating the air in that room uh, at a higher rate than normal. Uh, and I only buy the methanol uh, in about six gallons at a time. So our storage on campus uh, is always minimal to, to eliminate some of those risk factors. I do know of a gentleman uh, who purchased uh, methyl alcohol on a 55 gallon drum uh, while he was working for a school. And he actually got uh, contacted by the DEA because they thought he might be starting some sort of a, a you know, controlled substance laboratory. <laughs> that quantity so yeah you're, you're purchasing by the gallon is a much smarter idea <laughs> shop local <laughs> yeah, right. and uh, a shop in small quantities yes it's it's it just it makes much more sense uh safety wise but if you're if you're in a rural school where uh you know uh resources and finding a, a methanol vendor is difficult i can i can see why you would want to buy it more in bulk uh, in St. Louis here, we have a variety of uh, outlets, uh, mainly um, uh, racing uh, shops, uh, supplying methanol to those who uh, do high performance uh, racing vehicles. So um, I just tapped into that network and, and been able to buy it, you know, gallons at a time. 
Yeah, I think smaller quantities from a storage standpoint also helps too. You can store yeah. a gallon or two in a flammables cabinet without much trouble, but if you're going to store a 55 gallon drum, that's a, <laughs> that's a different story. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I, I've thought about it. Uh, sometimes the price goes up, and I think, oh, maybe I should buy in bulk, but it's it's not worth it. I just I can't bring myself to to buy that much at a time. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much uh, again, Eric. This is a, a great presentation, um, and I'm I'm sure this will be a benefit to a lot of other folks that are uh, working in this area. So we appreciate you taking time out of your Friday afternoon to to share your work with us. Oh, uh, it's a pleasure, Ken. I appreciate the invitation. I I appreciate the opportunity to share. Like I said in the beginning, anything I can do to share. Uh, the knowledge and promote biodiesel and get it out there into the schools and into students, uh, uh, you know, thought bubble, uh, you know, all the better for us. So uh, I appreciate uh, everybody attending. I appreciate all the great questions. Uh, and thanks, Ken. Thanks, Gabby, for helping me out with all this. All right. Well, with that, we'll conclude our webinar. And we hope to see everybody uh, coming up next month with Dr. Deb Hall for our, our next webinar on building automation systems. So Thanks again, Eric, and uh, we'll see everybody online. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I will have this up on the Create uh, website in about a week. So have a good weekend. Thank you. Eric, uh, real quick, I, I just want to offer. Um, so I have a lot, like, I, 